Hey, I'm Pastor Brian. So glad that you're checking out the sermon this week. Whether you worship here regularly and are catching up on a service that you missed, or you're watching to learn more about us as a church, your family. So welcome home. Before we get started, I'd invite you to check in with us by scanning the QR code that you see on your screen, or you can click the link in the description below. Now, let's check out this week's message. Sometimes I imagine where would I want to live if I could live anywhere? You know, like would you, would you live in another country? Would you live in another state? Would you live maybe close to your parents? Would you live close to your grandkids? Would you have a house in the, in the mountains or, or maybe a home at the beach or, or, or where, wherever it is? Where would you, where, where you want to raise a family? Where's the place that's free from crime, that's free from pollution, that's away from, from congestion and traffic. Say amen, church, on that traffic thing, right? Yes, right, exactly. Like, you just kind of wonder about those things. And, you know, and, and you, maybe you come up with a lot of, you come up with a list of, of different places. My dad used to, he, he used to say, um, you know, if I, could, if I could have anything, I'd have like, like 20 acres and, and I'd, I'd have all my family around me. And I remember thinking when I was younger, I was like, why in the world would I want to live with you guys and near y'all? And, and now that I'm way older, I understand my father way better, you know? I mean, and it, because, you know, you do have this pull to be, you know, close and, and in proximity and this kind of thing. You, just, you, you dream, I dream sometimes of, of retirement and where do I want to live and you know, what's, what's the community that I want to, want to be in and, and this kind of thing. And maybe some of you, you would just be like, no, I'm good. I, I want to stay, you know, like right, right here. I want to stay, I want to stay right in, in this moment. You know, I don't want to get away from, you know, all the stuff or the things or, or anything. And what I would tell you is this, that if, here's the danger, if we adopt an isolationist mentality that says, I do want to get away from, from all the headaches and the heartaches and the, the problems and the struggles and the difficulties and all the stuff in, in life, because let's face it, there's a lot of, there's a lot of mess out there. Amen. Like, all you got to do is turn on the news and you'll see it. There's a lot of heartache and brokenness and, and, and the world is kind of, you know, a dumpster fire, it feels at times. But if we, if we adopt this isolationist attitude, the danger is that what we will inevitably do, as appealing as it is, is we'll wind up not ministering to the people that God has actually called us to reach with the life-changing, radical grace of Jesus Christ, Right? This is, this, is where, this is just the truth. And this is the starting point for the book of Jonah. And this is where we're going to spend the next four weeks. Good morning. I'm Jeff, and I'm the senior pastor. Welcome home to everybody, whether you're a first-timer or you're a long-timer. We're really glad that you're here with us. Hey, if you have your Bible this morning, I want to invite you to turn with me to the book of Jonah. Uh, if you're using the Bible that's in front of you, and by the way, I would simply say, if you do not have an easy-to-read translation of the Bible, see that Bible right there? It's probably in front of you. It's underneath the chair, maybe in front of you. Take it. It's yours. You can't steal from the church when the preacher gives it to you, so it's free, and so you can have that. It's a real easy-to-read translation, and you're going to find Jonah on, in, that, in that particular Bible. You're going to find Jonah on page 763, so you can find that there. But before we dive in too deep and we talk about God and all the things related to him and Jonah, let's take a second and just sit in the presence of God. Let's pray. Jesus, we've sang, uh, we sang songs about you. We've prayed prayers to you. Now we open your word and we sit in your presence. And we pray, God, that you would speak to us. 
I pray, God, you would speak through me. Give us ears to hear what it is that you're trying to say to the church. That's us. In your name we pray. Amen. So in Jonah chapter 1, we're going to dive right in. Jonah chapter 1, beginning in verse 1 and 2, here's what we find. The Lord gave this message to Jonah, son of Amittai, get up and go to the great city of Nineveh. Announce my judgment against it because I have seen how wicked its people are. Now, if you had been living in the 9th century BC, and that's about this time, and you were a Jew, you would have never wanted to go to the city of Nineveh. It's the one place that you don't want to go to. Nobody is building a retirement home there. No one wants a second house in Nineveh. You know what I'm saying? You, beach, maybe, mountains, perhaps, Nineveh, never. You know, it's, it's, it's that kind of setup. And, and here's why. The, this, the particular city in Nineveh, it, which now, by the way, it's in northern in Iraq, uh, it's ruled by the Assyrian Empire. And the Assyrians are particularly cruel. They are a particularly cruel and, and, and vicious and heartless people. In fact, archaeological inscriptions have been found in which Assyrian kings boast of how they are cruel. They would, fl- they would flay their enemies and then hang their skin on the city walls after they've conquered a city in terms of just showing everybody else, hey, this is kind of what we do. This is an Assyrian king, this relief, gouging out the eyes of a prisoner of war. And so th- th- this is who the Assyrians are. They would, take, uh, all, they would take the skulls of all of the conquered individuals and the people that they had killed in battle and pile them up as a pillar. Uh, and, and again, it's, a, it's done as a deterrent. Um, What they also would do is they would take survivors of a battle and they would impale them on stakes in front of the town. By the way, Nineveh has not made Reddit's top 10 vacation spots, right? Like, that's just not, that's not there. Like, nobody wants to go there. So when, when Jonah is called to go to Nineveh, in, in many ways, uh, being called to go there, it's kind of like if you were a Jewish uh, rabbi being called to go preach to, say, uh, Nazi-controlled Berlin, Germany in 1942. You're like, nope, don't, don't just, I have no desire to do that. Or it would be like maybe today, it'd be like us being called to go and, and preach and witness to extremist terrorists in, say, some faraway country, like Yemen or something like that, you know? And so, so, you know, so I say that to simply say this. It's no wonder that Jonah runs away. Okay, you got to understand, and, and, and there's other issues at work as well, and we'll kind of peel that onion as we kind of walk through this entire book, but, but I want you to understand this morning, when we find ourselves in these moments when the call of God comes to us, there, listen to me, there's a risk that we all run when we run. Watch this, it's in verse 3. But Jonah got up and went where? In the opposite direction to do what? To get away from the Lord, he went down to the port of Joppa where he found a ship leaving for Tarshish. He bought a ticket and went aboard, hoping to escape escape from the Lord by sailing to Tarshish. Okay, here's a little bit of a geography lesson for us this morning. Again, as I mentioned to you just a moment ago, uh, Nineveh, here's here. This is northern Iraq. This is Joppa. Joppa is now the modern-day city of Jaffa, and, and that basically is like southern Tel Aviv, if you will. So it's there on the coast of Israel. He goes down there, and he just says, hey, uh, you, w- give me a ticket to the farthest place I can get away from God. And they go, oh, sounds like Tarshish. He says, perfect, I'll take one. And he winds up, this is like Gibraltar, it's southern Spain. That's about the best thing that we can think we can come up with. So what, 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 what is he trying to do? He's trying to go as far away as possible from God. So Nineveh is roughly, in this distance, it's roughly 550 miles northeast of where he is currently located. This is 2,500 miles away. You ever run from God? You ever go 2,500 miles away from God? Probably not. I mean, in terms of physical proximity, we probably have not run like that. I would dare say 
that there are some of us who've actually run 2,500 miles or more internally from God, right? Like we've all experienced at some point in our life that this notion of running away from God. You realize that God's calling you to do something. It's a task. It's a particular action. It's a course, of, a change of course and direction or whatever, but maybe it's out of fear or it's a rebellion or resistance or maybe it's just straight up old-fashioned sin. I know that's your granny's word, right? But it's just the truth because it's still biblical. And we still engage in it. And we, here's what we say. We go, nope. And we head off and we take the opposite direction. That's what we do. But here's the thing. The call on your life is still the same. The call hasn't changed. Now, to be sure, the destination may not be as places as, as dangerous as Nineveh is, right? But the call is the same, all the same. And maybe some of you in the room, for some of us, it's a change in behavior or it's, it's, a, it's a change in our, in our thought process or it's an orientation that we have to think about other individuals differently, whatever it is. And, and so it could be a call to, you know, maybe be more public with your faith, but instead we kind of hide the light. Maybe, maybe it, it's, it's, you're supposed to have a conversation with somebody about Christ and instead we just change the topic. Or maybe for somebody in the room, it's a call to forgive someone for a harm that they've done, and it was years ago. It was decades ago. And God's still calling you to forgive, but instead, you know what we do? We just delete them out of our phone, or we unfriend them in social media, right? Meanwhile, we're still holding on to the grudges, and we're still doing all that. For some in the room, God's calling you to be quiet to center in on Him, to pray, to pick up the Scripture, to go back into a place of prayer, to be with Him. And instead, you know what we do? We, do, we busy ourselves with a lot of religious activity and this kind of thing. God may be calling somebody in this room to a specific ministry to use your spiritual gifts. Remember, we took a spiritual gifts assessment, some of you. And, and, and so, all right, where is the place that God's calling you? And you know, maybe you know, maybe you don't. But God's calling you to use it. But instead, we just like, well, you know, we reason it away and we go... Yeah, later. And then there's somebody in the room. God's calling you into a relationship with Himself through Jesus Christ. And instead, we just throw ourselves more into our work. Or our kids, or our grandkids, or, you know, free time, or leisure. I don't know, it's whatever. All in an effort to run from God. Here's what I want to tell you. If you don't get anything out of Jonah 1, just get this right here. Ready? Right now is the right time to get right with God. Don't you put it off. Don't put it off. Don't wait till tomorrow. You know why? You don't, you're not guaranteed tomorrow. I mean, I don't know. That sounds you're like, way to go, Jeff. You know, I'm not trying to scare you into the kingdom, okay? Clearly, that's not it. But what I am trying to say is just simply to recognize what it is that God's given you. God's given you an opportunity. Every person in this room has the same opportunity. But Jonah, let's go back to him. What's he do? He runs. Jonah runs, but he can't what? He can't hide. Because God won't let him. And that's actually a good thing. It's a good thing that God won't let Jonah hide. It's a good thing that God won't let you hide. Because, here's the why. Because the worst place in the world for you to be is outside the will of God. Oh my goodness gracious. Watch this. Jonah chapter 1 verses 4 through 6. But the Lord hurled a powerful wind over the sea, causing a violent storm that threatened to break the ship apart. Fearing for their lives, the desperate sailors shouted to their gods for help and threw the cargo overboard to lighten the ship. But all this time, Jonah was sound asleep down in the hold. So the captain went down after him. How can you sleep at a time like this, he shouted. Get up and pray to your God. Maybe he'll pay attention to us and spare our lives. So it's like the sailors are praying to their gods. And he, they're, they're not listening. So go get that guy down in the, in, in the hold of the ship and, and see, see if he can do it. See, here's the deal. Sometimes troubles come to you, and they're just the stuff of life. Like, let's face it. We just said it a minute ago. Troubles happen. Difficulties occur. It's life. It's the stuff of life. Jesus even said, in this world, you're going to have trouble, but take heart. I've overcome the world. Okay, so we know there's going to be difficulties. And sometimes that's just, like we said, the stuff of life. But 
there are other times, perhaps when we may be running from God, and we've said no thanks, and we're choosing to go this way, that God allows things to happen in our lives that function in some capacity as a wake-up call to get us to come back around to God and to bring us front and center in His presence, right? That, and that's, that's it. And here's what I call these. I call these a severe mercy, and it is. And it's severe because it hurts. And it's merciful because the intention is to draw us back into the presence of God. It's to draw us back into the presence of God, to, 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 to align ourselves with God's will and God's way and God's love. And for Jonah, the storm, it's that. It is a wake-up call. And even though he is running from the presence of God and he's fallen asleep in the lowest part of the boat, it's almost like the writer is trying to say, he is as far away from God as you possibly could be. Because, here's why. Because when we are purposefully running from the will of God, it's almost as if we have fallen asleep spiritually. We have. You see this all throughout the New Testament. People say, oh, so-and-so has fallen asleep, you know, and they don't mean they died necessarily. I mean, they could be, but more often than not, if you've fallen asleep in the faith, that's just it. You've just kind of fallen asleep. And so we take God and we put him on the back burner and we kind of put him back there and he's out of sight. And so if God's out of sight, he's out of mind and that kind of thing until God sends a wake-up call. So captain comes down, wakes up Jonah. Jonah stumbles up on stage or on deck and watch what happens. Then the crew cast lots to see which of them had offended the God and gods and caused this terrible storm. And when they did this, the lots identified Jonah as the culprit. Why has this awful storm come down on us? They demanded, who are you? What's your line of work? What country are you from? What's your nationality? They're looking at Jonah and they're going, who you is? And where are you from? And who's your people? And what have you done to us, right? And there's this sudden moment. See, because even, listen, even in the face of extreme disobedience, here's what's powerful. Watch what Jonah does. Watch this. I'm a Hebrew. I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the land. Even in this moment, he is running from God, y'all. He's looked at God and God said, hey, go over there and do this thing. He went, not going to do it. And he took off and ran this way. But even in this moment, what's he declare? He declares who he is and whose he is. And so in this moment, he says all the right words with all the wrong heart. I just stood right over there. I just lifted my hands in worship, and I just sang a song, and I spoke Jesus. And you know what? I can do that all day long, and I can be as far away from God in my heart. And I can be just eaten up with pride and arrogance and hatred and unforgiveness and bitterness and name your thing. I mean, just name it, right? And so this is, this is the danger. And here's the thing. Every one of us in this room, if we aren't careful, we can go through this keeping up appearances exercise. And so it just becomes this thing, and we've all done it. I mean, if we're just honest with ourselves, we have. You know, you've come to church on a day. I mean, not today, of course, you know, right? But you've come in the past, and you've gone to church, and you're just thinking to yourself, oh, if I could just get through this, right? And you've sang the songs, and you've done the deal, and you're just like, I just want to sit down, fine, sit down. And you get through the thing, and you want to go, shut up, man. I've just heard you want, want, want. And you do the deal, okay, and the bread and the thing and the dip, and I'm out. Boom. And that's it. And this is the danger. This is the danger that we'll just go through the motions. We'll just go through the motions and we'll just keep up appearances. And, th and, and, and this is the danger for the church of Jesus because we can, we can get it all right on the outside and it can all be wrong on the inside. And we can still run from God while we're coming to church. Jonah chapter 1 verse 10. The sailors were terrified when they heard this. For he had already told them that he was running away from the Lord. You imagine this guy shows up and he goes, Hey, how much for a ticket to Tarshish? By the way, I'm running from the Lord. Jonah. Pleasure to meet you, I think. Right? Yeah, come aboard. Right? So watch the question that they ask him. Oh, why did you do it? They groaned. In one breath, 
Jonah is able to say he is running from God, and in the next breath he is able to say that he is the, he is the guy who worships the God who made the sea and the land. So again, the, the real personal application down to earth, your life, real time, right here, right now, is simply this. I don't care how old you are, it doesn't matter. Your age does not matter. On Sunday mornings, you can come in here and you can lift your hands and you can lift your voice and you can praise God and you can still be as far away from God and run in the opposite direction from God. Now, here's what's interesting with the sailors, real fast. The sailors display this really ancient mindset when it comes to gods and religion and this kind of thing. And so their understanding at this particular time in the ancient Near East was this, that, that gods were territorial. And so, you know, that, that god over there, he's over that patch of land, and, and that god's over that patch of dirt, and this god's over this patch of dirt, and, and you know, this gods are over this patch of dirt over here. But, you know, hey, you know what I'm just going to do? I'm just going to go ahead and run away. And so if I just run from this territory over to another territory, then I'm going to be safe, right? But, but who did Jonah say he worshipped? The God who made what was it? The sea and the land. In other words, you know what that means? That means Yahweh, his God, our God, has no jurisdiction. That means he's God over everything. You know what that means? It means what Brian read to us and what the psalmist tells us is still true. There's no place you can go to escape the presence of God. Psalm 139, verses 7 through 10, I can never escape from your spirit. I can never get away from your presence. If I go up to heaven, you're there. And if I go down to the grave, you're there. If I ride the wings of the morning, if I dwell by the farthest oceans, even there your hand will guide me and your strength will support me. And here's the thing. It, it, when we're running from God, listen to me. If, when we're running from God, it doesn't just affect us. Because oftentimes, here's what we think. We just go, this is, this is between me and God. Like, like this is just, this is my business and nobody else has a right to kind of get involved in whatever. But the truth of the matter is, when we're running from God, we bring others into our disobedience and our rebellion. Because that's what Jonah did. The moment he boarded the ship, he involved everybody on board. He brought all the sailors right into it. And, you know, we have a tendency to just go, no, nobody's business, just, just my own. No, 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 no. If you're going to run from God, guess what? You may drag your spouse into it. You're going to run from God, you may drag your parents into it. You're going to run from God, you may drag your classmates into it. You're going to run from God, you're going to drag your work family into it, whatever, your coworkers, all that kind of stuff. You run from God, you may drag your church into it, right? And so not only, listen, listen, not only do those individuals who are now drug into it, not only are they not receiving the blessing of you living in a right relationship with Almighty God and saying, yes, Lord, now they may even, to some degree, catch a little bit of the flack as a result of your own sense of rebellion. Wow! How much more do we need to be positioned and oriented to God to say yes to what it is that the Lord is wanting to do? So it's no wonder that God uses the words of pagan sailors to ask, to ask the question, oh, why did you do it? Verses 11 through 14, watch this. And since the storm was getting worse all the time, they asked him, what should, we, what should we do to you to stop this storm? Throw me into the sea. Well, that escalated quick. Right? Like, when was this a solution to any problem? And, he says, it will become calm again. I know that this terrible storm is all my fault. Instead, not willing to embark upon that solution initially... Instead, the sailors rowed even harder to get the ship to the land, but the stormy seas was too violent for them, and they couldn't make it. Then, time-based word, we don't know how long it took, then they cried out to the Lord, Jonah's God. Okay, so their gods aren't answering, so now they're going to dial in their, Jonah's God. Oh, Lord, they pleaded, don't make us die for this man's sin, and don't hold us responsible for his death. Oh, Lord, you've sent this storm upon him for your own good reasons. So the only solution that Jonah can come up with is suicide. And now listen, here's the thing. Life is hard. And there are times when that actually might look like a good solution. It's never the right answer. Listen to me. That is never, ever the right answer. There's always hope. 
Now, here's, here's the deal as it relates to Jonah, real quick. Like, Jonah doesn't go, throw me overboard. This is verse 14, and in verse 17, there's going to be this big fish. Like, I read the book, you know. Like, that's not the thing. It, it's happening, like, real time. He's on the boat, you know. So he doesn't know what's going to happen. But that's his solution. And, and we'll unpack that even further later. Not today. So watch this, verse 15 through 16. Then the sailors picked Jonah up, threw him into the raging sea, and the storm stopped at once. And the sailors were awestruck by the Lord's great power, and they offered him a sacrifice and vowed to serve him. I just imagine, put yourself in this picture, man. Get this scene in your head. I just imagine that this boat is just like rocking, and just suddenly like the, off in the distance, like light breaks through the clouds, and the clouds begin to dissipate, and the rain stops, and you can see the rain kind of move off, and everything just kind of begins to slowly kind of die down and everything, and they're just looking there. Maybe the mass is broken, and they've got crap strewn all over the, the top of the deck of the boat, and they're soaked, and they're just looking like they've just you know, they're like looking like wet rats, you know, I mean, and they just look at each other and they just want to go, what happened? Are we living in a dream? Because things are calm and the sun's bright and they look out across the waters and there's no Jonah. But they're thankful that they're still alive. Now listen, here's the thing. In the end, right, like you get to this point, running from God, running from God is actually, it puts Jonah in a far worse place than Nineveh ever was to start with. Doesn't it? I mean, it does. Wouldn't it have been better if God had come to Jonah and said, hey, I need you to go and preach to these people? Wouldn't it have been better if Jonah just said, okay. Instead, he goes, nope. And it would have been way better had he just said yes, because watch what happens. You imagine he just hits the water, and he starts to stink. And maybe he's floating, and maybe whatever. Maybe he just goes, ah, who cares? And he just inhales some water and whatever. And then suddenly, now the Lord had arranged for a great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was inside the fish for three days and three nights. What did the brother think of when he woke up, you know? When he woke up and he was inside the belly of a, of a fish, he just thought, well... This wasn't on my radar screen. You can, ha- you can have zero knowledge of the Bible. None. You can know nothing about the Bible, but I'll guarantee you, you are familiar with the story of Jonah and the whale. Exactly. Right. Because that's what we think of. In fact, the two are oftentimes synonymous. Never mind the fact that Jonah's name means a dove, which is a symbol of peace, which is exactly what he does not have within his life. Because he is running from God. Because what we do is is we get all wrapped up on the wrong stuff. There's only two verses that really mention this fish idea. And in the Hebrew, it doesn't say whale, it says fish. So there's this great fish. But we all get hung up because we're just smart analytical people. And so we just want to go, well, well, how do we know that a man can live inside a fish? That's not the point. Because oftentimes, this is what we think of. We think about Jonah, that's what we think of. And I would like to say that is a fiction. That thing is not real. But this is the idea. This is sometimes what we think. A fellow by the name of Thomas Carlyle says this. He says, The problem is that we spend our time wondering what's going on inside the whale rather than wondering what's going on inside of Jonah. Right? Because that's, that, that, that's, that's where the real issue sits. Because personally, I'm not concerned about that. I don't even care about that. I'm, I'm more concerned, I'm more concerned not answering all the philosophical questions of can a man live inside the belly of a fish. I'm more concerned that Christians, yourself, are going to read this book and choose to focus on this one teeny tiny small detail and you're going to miss the overarching idea that the whole book contains, which I would dare say is simply this idea. Our God has a heart to reach the world. And our God is willing to go to great lengths to do so because God has a global vision of reaching all people, even the cruel and the evil, even the people that we would automatically write off, right? Like if God called us to go preach to the, the extremist, whatever, we'd be like, man, there ain't no hope. They're outside the reach of God. Like, hey, there's no way. They're so far, they're, they're so far beyond saving, Right? Because that's exactly what Jonah. That's exactly what Jonah is thinking. But God has a desire to reach people with the life-changing message of Jesus Christ. 
So, here, so here, here's your assignment. Here's your assignment. This week, you don't have to answer the question, is God calling me? He already is. He's always been calling you. That's not the question you have to answer. The question isn't, is God calling? The question is simply this. What are you going to do when he calls? So when God calls you to serve, when God calls you to forgive, when God calls you to reconcile, when God calls you to follow Jesus, when God calls you to tithe your money, when God calls you to pray for the lost, when God calls you to fast from a meal or two, when God calls you to go to counseling, when God calls you to reconcile with your spouse, when God calls you to make the phone call to your estranged child, when God calls you to give up your addiction, when God calls you to do all of the things that you know you need to, you have a choice. You can either run to God or you can run away from Him. This is it. Why is this important? (laughs) It's important so that Jesus won't have to say about us what He said about His own generation. And that was this. The Ninevites were better. Because in Luke chapter 11, this is what Jesus says. The people of Nineveh will also stand up against this generation on Judgment Day and condemn it. For they repented of their sins at the preaching of Jonah. Now, someone greater than Jonah, who's he talking about? He was talking about himself, that's right. Now, someone greater than Jonah is here, but you refuse to repent. Listen, from Jonah chapter 1, don't miss this. Right now is the right time. To get right with God. Thanks for checking out this week's sermon. If you haven't already, we'd love for you to join us in person at either our 9.30 or 11 o'clock worship services. Our desire is to help people worship, grow, and serve together as we become disciples of Jesus Christ. So next time you come into worship, swing by our Connect desk, say hey to me or Pastor Jeff. We'd love to see you. We hope that you have a great week, and we'll see you soon here on the Hill.